Good morning. I, I know that uh, in Boston, a 9 a.m. start is a tough thing for people to make. Um, you know, it's interesting having gone to the university to do my PhD in Minnesota, where they actually had 7.15 a.m. classes in my day. And, you know, the, the way they always looked at it, there was plenty of time to work with the cows before the 7.15 a.m. class. Uh, but I really appreciate everyone being here this morning and to the symposium celebrating the opening of the Rajan Kilachan Center for Life Science and Engineering and to celebrate the enormous potential of the endowment fund uh, that Rajan has established uh, to support research at the intersection of life science and engineering. Uh, this is really a landmark day for Boston University because we celebrate really investments by the institution and by Rajan and his family in the future of research that really, I believe, affects the future of the human condition and of our planet. We feel, as an institution, that focusing uh, effort on the integration of life science and engineering is really key to so many of the grand challenges that the world faces over this century, including human health, the human condition generally, food security for the Earth's inhabitants, and the impact of climate change on all organisms. All are impacted by research that's coming at this interface. Um, examples, I think, of that are all around us, from imaging, uh, new imaging methods and computational methods for understanding the workings of the human brain, new technologies for gene insertion, um, and gene manip genetic manipulation that are leading to breakthroughs in understanding disease, genet genetic disorders, and new cures, and also affecting the way food is made in, uh, going forward. Um, eventually, I believe we will, using these technologies, be able to synthesize living organisms from cells to tissues, and eventually all the way to organs that will affect human health. Uh, the fusion of genotyping and splicing with computer science is having an enormous effect as well. As I said, from food security to development of plants that can withstand the harsher environments caused by global warming. My hope is that this symposium this morning and the research this afternoon will give us all a window into the power of this research field going forward. Uh, I can think of no one better to it, position to lead off our symposium than Mark Kastner, president of the Science Phil Philanthropy Alliance, a coalition of leading foundations committed to increasing financial support for basic <laughs> research. In his rear view mirror is a distinguished career as a professor of physics, uh, department chair and dean of the uh, School of Science at uh, MIT. He earned all his degrees at the University of Chicago and was a research fellow at Harvard before joining MIT. His research group is well known for discovering the first semiconductor single electron transistor. Mark is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. My account of his career and accomplishments is necessarily brief and incomplete, but it's safe to say that he brings great depth of knowledge and research credibility to the advocacy work that he now does. I'm grateful he took the time to be with us today and confident that you'll find his words illuminating and instructive. Mark. Well, I'm, I'm a, a really a deeply honored uh, that, that Bob invited me to speak to you this morning. Um, <clears throat> when he invited me, I didn't know the name Rajan Kilachan. Uh, and yesterday, I, I must say, I was just overwhelmed uh, by uh, Rajan's generosity uh, to Boston University, uh, and it is a spectacular example uh, <clears throat> of what uh, science needs. And I'm going to talk this morning about the role of, of uh, philanthropy in basic research. Um, uh, and. I have to begin that discussion by talking about the role of federal government in funding basic research because <clears throat> certainly in the United States, I think in all countries, uh, the, the primary responsibility for funding basic science has to come from the federal government. So let me show you a few um, 
uh, features of that and the, the history of federal funding for science in the United States. So this is a chart, I hope you can see it, um, of the expenditures by the federal government uh, on research and development. Uh, the red curve um, uh, is not uh, as a fraction of non-defense spending, uh, federal non-defense discretionary budget, and the blue is uh, including defense. And what you can see is the amazing fact that except for the Apollo program in the 1960s, that R&D has been a constant fraction of the discretionary budget. And it's hard to ask for more than that, right? Um, the, the problem um, is if you look at how that discretionary budget is made up, uh, you take it apart into different components, um, you can see that uh, the gray curve is defense, um, uh, non uh, R&D uh, non defense spending. Um, the the, the um, red curve uh, includes re all kinds of investments such as research and education. The only component that is growing as a percentage is payments to individuals. And that's growing extremely rapidly. This is what you hear referred to as entitlements. It's dominated by Medicare and Medicaid uh, payments to old people like me. Uh, and and it, it, in, under these circumstances, the discretionary part of the budget has to shrink because everything is going to these payments to individuals. Unless the country figures out how to pay for that, either by increased revenues or, or uh, slowing the growth, there's an inexorable decrease in the discretionary budget. And for that reason, our investments in uh, GDP as, uh, for the nation as a whole, and this includes all uh, expenditures, not just the federal governments, but industries as well, has gone from first in the world as a fraction of GDP to 10th. And if you believe, as most economists do, that, that R&D is the driver of the economy, this spells really bad things for the long-term health of the economy. So that's, that's really scary. Um, and, and you can see it here, but the, what actually has happened is that although the R&D uh, percentage of, of the uh, GDP is going down, that's the top curve, if you ask just about research, it's actually done much better. So um, we often complain about the, re the government not funding research. Actually, it's funded research much better than development. It's development that has been curtailed dramatically. Another way to look at this is if you look at basic research as a percentage of the GDP, um, until about 2005, um, it was really doing very well. So uh, we, we, we really have nothing to complain about as, as researchers. Uh, but we have a lot to be afraid of. And you can see that downturn in the last five years, particularly the steep downturn since 2012. That was what's called the sequester, when all discretionary spending began to be cut. Um, it, it was inevitable uh, because of the background that I told you, that if the discretionary budget keeps shrinking, eventually it's going to hit research as well. Um, at the same time, there's an additional uh, dramatic change in how that research money is spent. And uh, this is a plot of federal funding by discipline. Um, the top curve is the life sciences. And you can see this huge increase um, in the late 1990s. That was the doubling of the NIH budget. And of course, if you keep research spending constant, and you increase the NIH budget, it has to come from somewhere. And it came from engineering, and it came from the physical sciences. So we've, we've had a huge shift in how the research uh, money is, is distributed. 
And I don't think anyone has addressed seriously what that means for the long-term health of the economy. So I think it's particularly wonderful that the new uh, Kilichan Center is bringing together life sciences with engineering and physical sciences because it, it helps maintain the physical sciences infrastructure at the same time. So what are the universities doing under these circumstances when research funding from the federal be government begins to decline? And again, you can see the top curve is the, the these, these are plots of where the universities in the United States get the money for research. Where do the revenues come from? And the top curve is the federal <clears throat> government component. It's still the biggest, but you can see it's uh, declining in, in, in the last few years. The curve which is rising, the only curve which is rising as a percentage, is the university's own expenditures. And where do those come from? Those come from gifts like the one we're celebrating today. They come from the endowments of the universities which they can spend on helping to hire new faculty members by giving them startup packages, by providing uh, seed funds for new initiatives. Um, this is what is keeping the enterprise going now, is the increase in philanthropy that has built up endowments of the universities. So that's the background. Um, uh, one more piece of the background is that with this current administration, there's not much hope that things will get better from the federal government. So these are the proposed cuts in the science budgets by the Trump administration. Really dramatic, draconian cuts um, in, in every agency except uh, DARPA, the defense agency. Um, uh, the NIH was proposed a 20% cut the NSF was pr proposed a 10% cut. These are not going to happen because wise people in Congress are not going to allow it to happen. But it tells you that the, 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 the direction is not a good one. And unless um, uh, we can change things in Washington, it, it, it will continue uh, to be quite scary. So what is the role of private funding of philanthropy in, 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 this, uh, in this situation. Um, we did a survey uh, last, last year for the second time. Uh, we asked all the AAU, American Association of Universities, all the universities to fill out the survey. Um, only about half of them could do it. I was pleased that BU did fill it out. Uh, Harvard said they have absolutely no way of knowing how much money they get every year. Because, <laughs> and I believe it because they are so decentralized. Um, uh, in, in the first year, Stanford also said they couldn't do it, but they figured out how to do it by the second year, so that was good. Um, uh, we asked them uh, about the sources of uh, their philanthropic funding and, and what they go for. And this is just one piece of, of what we learned. Um, uh, we got a number of over $2.3 billion uh, in philanthropic funding for basic research in 2016. And again, that's, that's a, an underestimate because we missed some important players. Um, but it's very unlikely that the number is more than $4 billion or something like that if you include all the universities. Um, and so I think this gives you a sense of the overall scale of philanthropy for basic research um, and where it goes. And you can see that like the federal government, the vast majority goes for biomedical research. So what can we say from this and, and other things we know about philanthropic funding is that it's a fraction of the federal funding. It's not going to make up for cuts of the size that Donald Trump proposed. Uh, it's, just, it's just not on that scale. Um, but it does some things that are really different from what the federal government does. It can target areas that the government won't cover. And the philanthropists that we talk to um, really want to do things the federal government is not doing. Um, 
It, philanthropy can be nimbler. It can do things more quickly. It can be flexible. Um, it can take a longer term view. It can um, fund uh, more support for longer periods, um, uh, which allows scientists to really do things that are more uh, bold and, and, and uh, riskier. Um, and it's less constrained by politics, so it does, doesn't have to worry, as the federal government does, of funding uh, institutions in small states as well as Massachusetts, right? Um, and it can kickstart government funding. We've seen examples where gifts from philanthropy have actually gotten big government programs off the ground. The Brain Initiative is a, is a great example of that. So we, the F Science Philanthropy Alliance was formed in 2012. It was just at the time when we began to see the federal funding for research declining. And um, the mission from the very beginning was very clear. So our mission is to increase private support for basic science research. Clear mission, but it was really hard to figure out what the strategy should be. Um, uh, the board, uh, which, which I'll tell you about in a while, tried a number of things and they were about to give up completely and then they hired me and that was their last resort. Um, uh, and I had no idea what the strategy should be either. But we began to meet with wealthy individuals and their representatives who were interested in science and we began to understand that they found funding science very difficult. They found it daunting. One of them said frightening. And so we realized that with our member organizations, and I'll tell you who they are in a moment, uh, we had the expertise to advise philanthropists on effective ways of supporting science. And we thought, and we still believe, that if they're effective, they'll get satisfaction out of it, and they'll keep doing it. Uh, if, if they make mistakes, they'll be embarrassed and they won't want to keep doing it. So being advisors to philanthropists is, is our strategy. As I said, there's a challenge, which is philanthropists find the landscape very complex. Um, and um, our business model, if you can think of it as a business, which it's not, uh, is to have our member organizations support our activities so that we can provide these uh, advising services for free to new philanthropists. So what do we do? We advise them uh, about mechanisms for funding. We connect them with other scientists and most important with our other philanthropists. They meet the member, our member organizations um, uh, and our members can tell them about their experiences. Um, and we create documents about best practices in science philanthropy, so we inform them. And we have, we have meetings and, and workshops where these philanthropists can get together in a protected environment where no one's asking them for money, and they can talk to each other, and that really is a very beneficial thing. So this is an example of a couple of philanthropists we advised. This is Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan. And you can see that this is when they were expecting their first child. So this was August of 2015. Uh, we were introduced to them by word of mouth. Uh, and we began advising them and worked with them for over a year until uh, last September when they made this wonderful announcement that they're going to commit $3 billion uh, over 10 years for basic research in the life sciences. And it's really basic research. They're going to be developing tools and um, approaches for really solving uh, the fundamental problems underlying human disease. So that's a great success. It's one we can talk about. Uh, others of our advisees don't want us to talk about them or even mention their names. And that's completely understandable. Um, when we meet with the new philanthropists, we explain that we're not raising funds. We don't, we don't ask them and we don't want them to give us money. We want them to give BU money or other institutions. We want them to support the science. Um, and so we don't make grants. 
And we're not an advocacy organization. We're not going to go to the federal government and, and advocate for more funding. Many of our member organizations really want to stay far away from any advocacy. We have two, set, two kinds of members. Um, the full member organizations um, have seats on our board. So this is our board of directors. Uh, Robert Kahn of the Kavli Foundation is our chair. Uh, Henry, Harvey Feinberg um, uh, is president of the Moore Foundation. Paul Joskow is president of the Sloan Foundation. Aaron O'Shea, president of Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Jim Smith is the head of science at the Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome Trust is the newest of our full members, so now we have a footprint in the United Kingdom. Uh, Jim Simons is not the president of his foundation. He's just the founder of his foundation. Um, and uh, Danny Gash uh, is interim president of a small foundation you may never have heard of, Research Corporation for Science Advancement. Uh, but that's one of the, probably the oldest found, uh, science funder foundation in the country. It's over 100 years old. And it has a long list of Nobel Prize winners in physics and chemistry to which it gave very small grants when they were young faculty members. These are our full members. Uh, they take ultra, ultimate responsibility for our operating expenses. Um, but we've now added associate members. These are um, sometimes smaller organizations um, such as the Lasker Foundation. The Lasker Foundation is a very small foundation but has an outsized impact because it gives the Lasker Prizes, which are quite well known as precursor to the Nobel Prize. Um, and Mary Lasker's mission was to increase funding for basic uh, biomedical research, and so their mission is very closely aligned with us. So that's an example of one limit. But you can also see the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, uh, that's a very big effort, but they're very new to science philanthropy. They're not ready to make the kind of commitment that more established uh, foundations make to our efforts. So these are supporters of ours, but not at the same level as the, as the full ones. Um, we now have a total of 22 members. So uh, when I started, there were just the six founding members, and we now have 22. And this is a statement, I think, of how important, uh, how many um, philanthropists see basic science as an important thing to support. Um, that they think our mission is important and, and we're doing some good for them. And they, they really find it valuable to meet with the other philanthropists. We also have a couple of consultants whose names you may recognize, uh, David Baltimore and Robert Bergeno. You may think that this is my MIT uh, bias uh, because David, of course, was the first founder of the Whitehead Institute and Bob was Dean of Science at MIT. But actually, they were consultants before I was hired, so I take no responsibility. And Robert Jan, who was president of HHMI uh, and now returned to Berkeley, uh, he was on our board uh, before he became a consultant. The consultants are very important. I can, if you're interested, you can ask me what they do. Um, this, is, this is our senior advising staff. Um, there are just three of us, um, and uh, we, we spend a huge amount of time talking to philanthropists and their staffers um, about really the nuts and bolts of science philanthropy. So let me tell you some of the questions that we get from philanthropists. First, and probably the most common question we get is, where are the gaps in funding? What can I do that no one else is doing? Um, I had one funny experience where at one of our uh, uh, meetings, a woman who works for a billionaire came up to me and she said, we want to put our money where no one else is putting it. Where, what should we do? And I pointed out the survey and said, you know, if you really have, want to have an impact, give the money for physics or chemistry or mathematics. And she said, oh, no, I meant where are the gaps in cancer research? <laughs> <laughs> and so we began trying to help her find gaps in cancer research, which is not easy these days. But um, uh, I think we, we know that 
all of the philanthropists really do want to do something that no one else is doing. And they want to have an impact. Uh, and they want to be able to measure impact. And this is an interesting thing, is that even the most well-established foundations we work with, uh, like the Wellcome Trust, are still struggling with how do you measure the impact of science funding? Because we all know that the impact actually often takes decades to really measure. And so, you know, your board of trustees won't wait that long and you need to have some measure. So we've actually had three workshops where almost all of our member organizations attended discussing what are the best ways of measuring the impact of, of basic science uh, funding. What funding mechanisms are there? This is something we ask, get asked all the time. And the first thing I always say is that you do, should do what our friend Rajan did, which is to find an institution that you trust and let them make the decisions. I think that, that what the un universities in the United States do better than any institutions in the world is to hire the best people and give them the resources they need. And so we always say that if you want to do it in an easy way, an effective way, a way that you will be proud of, give money to a great institution and let them make the decisions because they are going to protect their reputation over the long term. And they're going to be around for a long term. What, what companies in the world have been around as long as the great universities? None. And so this is a really safe bet. We always say that. However, many of the people we talk to say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to fund an area of science, and I know that the best people are at many different institutions, and I want to find the best people who are doing the most exciting things. And so we help them think through whether they should fund individuals, whether they should create a program. Uh, there are many, many options, and we walk them through that. Effectiveness, that's really uh, uh, the general issue of how do you do this well. And the most common question we get along those lines is how do I form a, a strong science advisory board? So if you are not going to trust a, an institution, then what you need to do is to have members of the scientific community that you can rely on to help you make the decisions. And um, it, it, it astounds me how, uh, how people who are so effective in the business world can make mistakes when they start putting together a science advisory board. They may get enamored with a particular scientist, uh, fund him, and it's usually a him, not a her, and then ask him to be chair of their science advisory board. <laughs> The simplest issues of conflict of interest are just not appreciated. And so we have made a document walking through all the steps of creating a science advisory board, including drafting letters, appointing the board, and uh, you know, having terms of, of uh, 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 service, and so on. Uh, and so we, we really try to work through those kinds of uh, mechanistic things so that people will not feel embarrassed by what they do. That would be the worst thing in the long run. Um, and that's, what, that's the last topic. So that's, that's what we do, and I'm happy to stop there and answer any questions that you have. Um, it's a great question. Um, uh, let me tell you a story which is uh, help answer that. Uh, I went to visit the president of the Gates Foundation. 
She had given uh, some speeches in which she talked about the importance of basic research. And I hoped maybe this meant that she was going to begin having Gates fund a little more basic research rather than the short-term things they focus on. Um, and she knew I was going to ask that. So before I even started, she headed me off by saying, she describes the foundation as a family business and there's a mom and a dad. This is what describes every organization we work with. Um, there's a mom and a dad, and sometimes mom and dad explain very clearly to the staff of the foundation what they want, and sometimes they explain nothing. And a lot of what we do is trying to help the staff figure out how they're going to put things in front of the a mom and dad that they will like. Um, it's very complicated, and there's just no uniform answer, right? So this process, this, this is what we do, right? What we hope was is that they will begin to think broadly about the kinds of issues you're talking about. Um, and if you look at the Moore Foundation, for example, I think they do this well. They, you know, when they have uh, resources to start an initiative, they ask for the Science Advisory Board to give them ideas and then they will try to find the best people at all institutions that are working in, in those areas. But you can't control how this goes. If you don't mind, just a second unrelated question. Foundations are known not to want to pay overhead. Okay. Now, that has been identified as the reason that the current administration and government Correct. should also not pay overhead. <laughs> Amazingly, this comes up often when I talk to universities. Um, it, it, it is a big problem. And at our last members meeting, we had uh, uh, Mary Sue Coleman come and speak about this issue. Uh, Bob Bergino talked about this issue from the perspective of, of Berkeley. Um, uh, we, you know, there was a sympathy from the foundations about this issue. Um, uh, in the end, uh, I doubt that it will change because it would mean giving fewer grants, right? I mean, you know, they're, they're spending a certain amount of money every year, which they have to spend by law, and they're going to spend that same amount of money. And if they paid indirect costs at a higher level, they would have fewer grants to give. And so, you know, it's true of the government too. And, you know, fortunately, uh, Mr. Trump actually galvanized the Congress and, and got unanimity on this issue so that there's now la language in the NIH uh, legislation saying that the government cannot reduce the indirect cost. Uh, so, you know, he brought the country together. <laughs> One of the things I think that when you get in the quiet with a group of university presidents that people are really worried about is that one of the great things about our system has been the open market among universities. And you know, the, the world, the picture you're painting, which is absolutely accurately painted, Mark, is going to narrow the players over time. Absolutely. Because only the universities that can eat, find a way to continue to stay on that growth curve, which you showed of university support, are going to be players. And Absolutely. more and more, especially state institutions, Absolutely. are going to fall off because they're going to get under legislative pressure not to do it. And I, you know, I imagine when you think about your survey, you know, the, the survey is a politically complicated document, right? Because it's politically complicated because if seen inside a constituency, either a state or an institution, it's the trade-off between tuition and fees and other good things yeah. the university does uh, in the education arena against supporting research. Yeah. D does your board talk about that, about what the long-term consequences? Not, not of what you're doing, but just to picture the world in which we're living. So, you know, we haven't discussed it much. I think that this, the issue you're raising, I'm glad you did that because I meant to mention this. The wonderful thing about the U.S. Uh, uh, educational research system 
since between the Second World War and 2012 is that the federal government had enough resources so it was a level playing field. If you had great research, wrote a great proposal, you would get funded, um, and it didn't matter that much where you were, which institution you were from. This is changing the playing field, and it's not level anymore. It's not level. And um, you know, I don't know. I, I, you know, I think the reason we do this this uh, survey in large part is to make it clear that philanthropy is never going to fill the gap. Because we hear from Congress people, why doesn't philanthropy take care of this? And our answer is it never will and it can't. The, the other point I'd make about that slide, because it, it's a critically important slide, is there's also this narrative that industry will fill the gap. And industry is the blind and the noise at the bottom of the plot. That's exactly it right. It never moves, right? So there's a narrative, and you hear our administration talking about this, that yeah. things you should move off for industry to fund. Publicly traded companies cannot do it. Correct. And that's why the federal government really has to be the primary source of funding. Yes. Uh, segue, to segue off of what uh, Bob just uh, mentioned about the growth curve and how um, one could anticipate, anticipate that uh, in the future state schools and other smaller institutions may begin to uh, actually almost fall off the map. So in that sort of scenario, if you project out, let's say, 10 years strategically, is there a sense that there may come a time where the big players, let's just say it's BU and Harvard uh, and MIT or whoever they might be, they might combine their resources more whereby research is conducted in a multi-university type, multidisciplinary environment? You know, that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about the long-term consequences that much. Um, uh, I think the University of California system is a really interesting uh, uh, experiment in all of this. Um, uh, as you know, there, there are two universities in the UC system which are really the dominant players in research, uh, Berkeley and UCLA. Um, uh, my friend Bob Bergino explained to me that in the 1960s, 60% uh, of Berkeley's budget came from the state. That number is now less than 10%. Um, uh, the state universities have been privatized and some of them are doing very well, thank you very much. Uh, UCLA and Berkeley keep doing well, uh, partly because they get a lot of research dollars, but also because they can get out of state students uh, and out of the country students to come and pay the same tuition as they would pay at BU or MIT. Um, and the other universities are in terrible shape. So there's going to be a winnowing out uh, inevitably if things don't turn around. Um, we, we have more collaboration, I think, than, than we did in years past. Uh, I know at MIT we have a couple of uh, um, um, NSF centers, which are joint between NSF and Harvard, uh, between MIT and Harvard, um, and I think there will be more of that. I think those are important opportunities. Um, but I, you know, if, if, if the resources shrink, the enterprise has to shrink. And then the question is, who's going who's gonna to go away? You know, I would say that um, there are examples, uh, and some of them driven by philanthropic support of this happening. And the best example around is the Broad Institute, yeah. which actually brought together the Harvard-affiliated hospitals in Harvard and MIT for the first time. Correct. And what did it was a lot of money. Yeah, right? uh, correct. It's not a secret, right? If you put a lot of money on the table, you can make things happen that would not happen. But you also are seeing <clears throat> what I would call pre-competitive sorts of collaborations that you just would not have seen two decades ago. And uh, I point to the Mass Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing yes. Center. Yes, oh, uh, great Colorado, example, great where, example. Where Harvard, MIT, BU, and the state came together to build a, a, a single computer center. Right, um, and why did we do that? Because we were all spending way too much money buying power in the Boston area and converting 
labs to machine floors. Right. And it's, but it's pre-competitive, right? It kind of sits under the radar screen. Uh, but it is also now the largest, if you look at number of CPUs, the largest uh, university-owned computer center in the world, yeah. right? So, and that's a great example. But it's, it's pre-competitive. Nobody's going to get a Nobel Prize. Nobody's going to get a Nobel Prize. And, and there are many of you, uh, and many of our faculty and students that use it and don't know that whether the machine you're actually run on was bought by MIT, Harvard, or BU, because you can't tell, right? And, and so that's the way it, wor it works. The other thing, point I'd make about your, your question is uh, distance matters. And so the play, it, as this world turns and collaborations become important, the places that are gonna have the advantage, it's almost a medieval statement, are the people that are close together, right? And we have a, def a definitive advantage in Boston, right? That if you're, if you're the University of Wisconsin in Madison, you're out, not, I'm not gonna say the middle of nowhere because it'd be somebody from Wisconsin. <laughs> but the point, the, the point is you cannot take a mass transit or Uber to another AAU institution, right? And that's a huge advantage we have. Uh, and you know, many people here know that because of collaborations we have with the other institutions. Right. Other questions? Gloria? So a new model that seems to be emerging are things like uh, organizations such as Benefunder, which seem <laughs> to crowdsource uh, faculty research projects <laughs> to what they claim are a large philanthropic organizations. And I have no idea what their financial model is or how successful they are. So I wondered if you could say something about that. Um, so I've met with them, uh, with their CEO a couple of times. <clears throat> as far as I can tell, they've had no success whatsoever. Um, <laughs> Uh, their model is, is to work with uh, donor-advised funds uh, and try to get the donor-advised funds to put some money into their, the projects that they're trying to sell. Um, <clears throat> I don't, uh, my experience with philanthropists is this is a waste of time. It's just not going to happen. Uh, um, you know, there's this other uh, approach of taking uh, grants that just miss, miss the cutoff at NIH and getting donors to fund those. You know, the donors I talk to are not going to want to take the leftovers from anybody. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I, I, I don't think this, uh, this is going to be very effective. I have a question there and then Rachel. Yes. Okay. yes. So, um, so um, uh, BU, because it filled out the survey, can, can get all of the data. We didn't publish all of the data, but we did ask for uh, support in social sciences and the arts and humanities. They really are very bad. Uh, not quite as bad as mathematics, but very bad. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, you know, I think, uh, there's just no question that that philanthropists, you know, we had one philanthropist uh, tell us that um, astronomy and physics was his first love, but he felt a responsibility to use his wealth to help his fellow man. And for that reason, he felt that on the only way he could really do that was with biomedical research. You know, I mean, it's the same forces that are driving the federal government in this direction. It's the fear of disease, but combined with the enormous uh, excitement and progress in the life sciences. I mean, the, the, you know, Bob was saying last night that if he was starting over again, he would do something in the life sciences. I've told many of my friends that if I were starting over again, I'd work on neuroscience. Uh, there are just the, the scientific progress is just so rapid, it's just so exciting. Uh, so, you know, those two forces are, are hard to beat. Um, I think that there may be a, a bit of a turning in response to the political situation where the Congress, as well as the administration, are so uh, anxious to slash funding for the humanities and for the social sciences especially. And so there may be um, more organizations that are interested in helping, but I haven't seen it yet. Raja? Yeah, I just wanted to reinforce the statement you made that 
philanthropists should uh, focus on finding institutions whom they trust and then hand them over the dollars, as I have done. And there is a very good reason, because w as businessmen, in invariably you either inherit it or you make it in some commercial activity. We are not cut out to run uh, scientific institutions uh, or for whatever other. Uh, um, um, and you know, if you look around the world, uh, I mean, how many must be a handful of private individuals who have set up institutions who actually implement with their money, whatever the end causes they want to uh, do research on, like for example, Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates. Yes. And I had a very interesting conversation over the last two years. We had, I had visits from uh, a lot of the senior uh, directors um, to passing through Dubai. And for some reason, they got hold of me as Bob did uh, ten, seven years ago. <laughs> And I was uh, um, um, quite shocked when, uh, they were quite shocked when uh, they were asking me, uh, how do I, uh, how do we, uh, uh, we want your opinion on how do we galvanize uh, the new money which is enormous, uh, the new billionaires in India, the wealth that has been created, and not, and a lot of it by fine people uh, to uh, uh, give to, uh, more to, uh, uh, to uh, causes, to the, for, for example, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, yeah. and to encourage them uh, to do the same thing. And I said, don't waste your time. Because to begin with, just as you have called your uh, endowment fund Bill and Melinda Gates, so they would also like to do the same. And number two, everybody who is successful has a certain, uh, if I may, chutzpa or something. I think that's the American word that, you know, we can also do it. We don't need somebody else to private individual, but I think today, for example, for large uh, funds, uh, I don't, I mean, I'm just learning about the United States. Uh, <clears throat> India is a, uh, going to be quite a, 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 a the future in uh, large amounts of money like you folks yes. did with all the, your, uh, uh, when the development of uh, the United States with all the old names like the Rockefellers and blah, blah, and even now with Mark Zuckerberg and Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett and all that. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, they all have one common uh, 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 issue, as a matter of fact, and that is how do we, there is no institution there. For example, they would like to do the same thing that I have done with BU. Yeah. And they say, we don't want to do it overseas, we want to do it in our country because the need is great. But then there is no institution. So they're trying their best to develop one. And this alliance that you spoke about of philanthropists, um, I'm on my way in November to meet uh, Mr. Azim Premji, who is one of the top 20 billionaires on the planet. Uh, and in Bangalore, made his money in, um, in IT. Um, and um, so he's asked me to come and join the board and uh, you know, to share my experiences. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I think this, I just wanted to reinforce that the, the best way, and that's what I'm gonna advise, is to uh, <clears throat> give it to institutions whom you trust. But the problem is, for example, in India, it was all government, and nobody trusts the government yeah. of India in giving <laughs> large <laughs> billions of dollars. And that's a fact of life, <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, one more question. So, uh, you mentioned mathematics, and I think that's a very interesting one, because mathematics in this country wasn't anything spectacular until 1933 when Hitler decided to build it in Britain, great. It was very important during the Cold War, and then after the Cold War, we kind of neglected it completely. Uh, Boston is a model. Lab and Clay put tens of billions of dollars into promoting mathematics. And in the end, he packed up and went to England because of how Perlman and the whole thing, it's, it's a monumental embarrassment. And I think there's a, uh, a, a matter of public education. Uh, somehow universities have to not just worry about hiring a congressman or instead of getting old and sick, but you know, there's other needs of society and universities have to make that clear and that's nice of a part of it. So how do you... 
Well, so fortunately, we have Jim Simons. <laughs> Uh, Jim, uh, if you don't know, began life as a mathematician and really did groundbreaking mathematics, which became very important for uh, theoretical physics. Uh, and then he got bored and started playing the stock market and figured out he could use mathematics to play the stock market and became one of the most uh, successful hedge fund managers in the world. Um, and now he's giving it back and he's supporting mathematics and theoretical physics and supporting it in ways it has never been supported before. Um, uh, and so he's setting a good example. Um, your, your broader question is one we've struggled with a lot is how much should we be trying to educate the public? Um, and you know there was a, a very interesting survey done by an organization called Science Counts. Uh, and they wanted to try to figure out really what is the public, why is the, there not more public support for funding of, of science? And they found the very interesting result that the, the American people think science is wonderful. They have overwhelmingly positive feelings about science. They just don't think it's a very high priority. And getting things to be a high priority is really hard to figure out how to do. Uh, so our focus actually is to try to help the philanthropists do whatever they want as long as they're supporting basic science. We don't try to steer them one way or another because we don't think it would be very effective. Uh, and so we're glad there's Jim Simons. We hope there'll be some more. Let's thank Mark.